Так, уважаемые коллеги, здравствуйте. Я, конечно, вижу, что не совсем еще зал у нас... Uh, have uh, to participate in other events of the forum. Let me start uh, the session of our round table on uh, the features of legislative regulation in preparation and holding of major sporting events. As you know, actually today, the Russian Federation is one of the leaders in the global sporting movement, and we actually host uh, the largest international events and competition. Everyone has been impressed when they witnessed the organization of Universiade in Kazan in 2013 and brilliant victory and brilliant organization of the Olympics and Paralympics in Sochi. You also know that the Russian Federation will up to 2019 will host uh, 20 major sports events. This is a world championship on water sports to be held in 2015. In 2016, uh, Russia will host a world championship on hockey. Uh, hockey in 2017, there will be a cup of FIFA uh, conf confederation and in 2018 World Championship on football. In 2019, Russia will organize a Winter Universal in Krasnoyarsk. In 2012, we count that we'll have the right to hold one of the tours of World Champions, Europe Championship in football. The Russian Federation has uh, submitted uh, this uh, application. For 2020, we have submitted a bid for holding uh, the global uh, games of non-Olympic types of sports. So Russia has become a full-fledged mem uh, member of the international sports movement. And such events require legal legislative regulation particularly in cases when some of the events, uh, practically all these events, what I have uh, been mentioning, uh, in respect of all the events, the government of the Russian uh, Federation uh, submits a declaration on holding the events at a high level uh, to suit the conditions imposed by the organizers. All these events have different uh, terms of holding the competitions and hence the guarantees that are given by the government of the Russian Federation sometimes require publication and preparation and signing of a separate federal law, and uh, such laws uh, are available in our country. We have a law on organizing and holding uh, Olympics and Paralympics in Sochi, and now we uh, have the federal law on organization and holding of World Championship on football in 2018. All these guarantees and declarations, as we call them, uh, are mandatory for sports events, and they take into account the obligations on ensuring safety, on rendering a visa-free uh, regime or uh, uh, facilitated regime for getting visa to the Russian Federation, and they provide for the protection of the intellectual property of the organizers and determine uh, customs uh, incentives. Some of the events, for instance, World Championship on, fin uh, on football and uh, the Olympic Games provided for determination of special regimes of applying different legislation, I mean labor legislation, tax laws. And today uh, we are convinced that in all probability the Russian Federation will be ready uh, to uh, prepare separate federal law that will ensure organization and holding of the international uh, sports events in case of the uh, a bid is submitted so that, that uh, these regimes will be 
permanent uh, the federal law that wouldn't require any amendments to the national legislation. I can tell you that holding of such events uh, made it possible for us to regulate some matters that were quite problematic for us. Primarily, this is a provision of the safety in the course of sports events related with the behavior of the fans. You know that this theme uh, has become uh, quite topical in many countries, particularly the countries uh, of the football world, and the same problem also exists in the Russian Federation. Therefore, the enactment of such a law that determines uh, the rules of uh, behavior of the fence and that determines a prohibition for the fence in case they infringe the rooms uh, to attend uh, the games. That might be quite helpful uh, to ensure the safety. Organizations of major events made it possible for us to publish another law related with uh, unlawful uh, related to combating unlawful impact on the results of sports uh, competitions and regulation of the activity of bookmakers' uh, offices and the activities of different totalizers. We actively participate in preparation of the convention of the EU Council on that matter, and today uh, we have a guest uh, who will make his presentation on this theme. Besides, uh, due to holding major international events, we ensured a good anti-doping law. Today, we are one of the leading countries in uh, pursuing anti-doping policy and determination of different standards and educational uh, curricula. We realize that uh, holding of major sports international events makes it possible to improve legislation in the sphere of physical culture and sports, but at the same time it, ensuring that legislation we are facing the challenges which require uh, resolution primarily in the course of the discussions that we are going to have here today. We would like to listen to your opinion concerning certain matters. So the following agenda of our round table is proposed. We are uh, listening to the presentations uh, during 10 minutes after the end of the presentation, uh, not, uh, not more than five minutes are allocated for questions. Uh, some guests and uh, participants take part in subsequent roundtables or uh, leaving today, so we can ask questions immediately after the end of the presentation, and after the end of all the presentations, we'll organize a questions and answer session discussing the problems that have been raised or submit your proposals for uh, including into the resolution of the roundtable. If there are no objections, probably we'll start our uh, presentations. Uh, I would like to ask to give the floor to uh, Executive Secretary of the Enlarged uh, Partial Agreement on Sports in Europe, uh, our colleague uh, Stanislav Frassart. Uh, and uh, thank you for your kind uh, invitation. It's my honor to speak today in the International uh, uh, Legal Forum. And uh, I will uh, briefly introduce uh, what we are doing in the Council of Europe in the field of sport. And uh, first of all, the uh, Council of Europe, uh, it's an uh, intergovernmental organization which was founded in, the, in, in uh, 1949 and whose aim is to promote uh, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. You all know the European Court of uh, Human Rights. It's an institution of the uh, Council of Europe. But the uh, Council of Europe considered that uh, it was not enough to promote uh, these principles through uh, laws, uh, administrations, uh, courts, but it, has also to be, it needs also to be promoted through civil society, and that's why for 50 years we have an activity in the field of uh, sport. Council of Europe is uh, an, uh, an organization which has a number of uh, activities, uh, standard setting, monitoring, because we consider that it's not enough to have the best standards in the world, but we need to monitor to, to, to uh, make sure they are implemented. We have some support activities, seminars, training, publications, 
and we organize, that's also the case in the field of sport, uh, ministerial meetings which, uh, which allow the political leaders to address uh, topical uh, issues. I mentioned standard setting, and there are two kinds of uh, standards that are developed in the Council of Europe. There are uh, recommendations, which are legal standards, but uh, legally non-binding. There are political commitments and conventions. And the relation between re recommendation and conventions uh, can be uh, twofold. Sometimes we have a recommendation, and after a few years, there is a need to have a more binding commitment, and uh, it uh, evolves into a, a convention. Or sometimes we have a, a convention which needs bylaws in some technical issues, and therefore we, we, we develop recommendations uh, regarding the implementation of this uh, convention. I have to state that the field of sport is a peculiar uh, one. It's uh, not a law intensive sector for several countries because uh, sports is uh, about cooperation between sports movement and public authorities, but it's mostly a responsibility uh, of uh, sports movement. And uh, there are various models of organizations, but uh, several countries are very reluctant to have a strong involvement of the public authorities in the organization of sport. There's the principle of uh, autonomy of sport, which is also promoted by the uh, Council of Europe. Uh, and therefore, uh, several countries do not want to, to uh, develop their uh, policies in the field of sport through law, but uh, they prefer to have it through sports regulations. And that's why whenever we develop uh, recommendation and convention, it's not always translated into laws. Sometimes there are several ways to, to implement these, depending on the legal system uh, at national uh, level. We have uh, two conventions in force in the Council of Europe. The first one is the uh, Spectator Violence Convention, which was adopted in 1985. Uh, and the second is the Anti-Doping Convention, which was adopted in 1989. And uh, at present, we are uh, in the process of uh, finalization of a new convention, which will be uh, maybe a convention on uh, manipulation of sports competition against match fixing, which has become the uh, highest, uh, the most topical issue on the political agenda for uh, a few years uh, in both uh, sports movement and ministries responsible for sport. And we hope that uh, it will be adopted before uh, summer and open for signatures uh, at our next ministerial meeting in September. I, I, I won't have time to enter into the recommendations, but I want to mention two of them, uh, the European Sport Charter and Code of Sports Ethics, because those are a set of principles for the development of national sports policies and they are uh, really uh, observed and taken into account by countries whenever they update the uh, national uh, law on sports. And it was a strong contribution to a common understanding of uh, sports policies in, on the uh, European uh, continent. And, and these recommendations are still updated and uh, monitored by the uh, IPAS and the Council of Europe. We'd like to now to go, to go through uh, the uh, conventions uh, we have and uh, to point out which are the critical issues uh, whenever it comes to uh, translating this uh, convention into uh, legislation. On the uh, anti-doping convention, you see on the slide uh, the areas covered by the uh, convention. I, I won't comment uh, them. But uh, the critical issues when we monitor the implementation of this convention and we see that there is a lack of uh, uh, legal uh, background uh, for, to implement some measures are uh, the consent uh, of athletes for the collection of uh, personal data. For instance, data on health, data on uh, whereabout information uh, to allow uh, out of competition uh, testing. Those are highly personal information which are protected by uh, human rights standards and in principle, there is a need for, for a law to, to, to collect and manage this, uh, uh, this data in accordance with uh, human rights uh, principle, and this is a, a critical issue. Due, due to the fact that uh, several countries are, are reluctant to, to develop uh, legislation on sports issues or in do on doping in particular. Uh, another uh, issue is to make sure that uh, sanctions, th sanctions taken by the sports movement are compliant with the uh, law uh, and the human right at a uh, national level. Whenever there is a need for to set up a national agency, anti-doping agency or a special organization, there is a, a need for, for law. 
and uh, in the fight against trafficking of doping substance, there is a need to involve law enforcement organizations, customs, police, and this also requires law because if uh, doping or trafficking of doping substance is not considered as a, a criminal offense, it's difficult to involve uh, custom officers or police uh, in fight against trafficking of uh, doping substance. On uh, spectator violence, uh, there is uh, the implementation of stadium bans. Uh, stadium bans are flagship measures to, to prevent uh, trouble, uh, troublemakers to, to, uh, to, to, to be offenders of uh, hooliganism in, uh, within uh, sports events. And those uh, stadium bans are implemented sometimes through uh, court decisions, sometimes through, through private uh, decisions. And in many cases, it requests uh, some uh, legal background. And the uh, exchange of international information on uh, stadium bans to make sure that uh, people which are banned in some countries are prevented to, to attend competition in other countries. These are uh, tricky issues which uh, request uh, legislations. Also, the sharing of responsibilities between sports organization and uh, public authorities uh, is uh, something that was a main witness in the uh, uh, ASL drama what was, that was at the origin of the uh, Spectator Violence Convention in 1985, and there is a need for a legal uh, organization to, to, to clarify the sharing of responsibilities. On match fixing, uh, the convention is not yet uh, finalized, but we already see which are the, the critical issues to be implemented uh, through uh, legislations. And it will, it will be mostly on the international exchange of information, because this issue is very uh, globalized, and uh, it's possible to bet in any country on competition taking place in uh, any uh, other countries. And uh, we, we, we need to set up a good uh, system for exchange of information between betting operators, uh, public authorities, sports movement, including sometimes uh, personal data, and it will, uh, the exchange of uh, information will be very uh, demanding to be compliant with the uh, human rights uh, pr principle. Uh, the cooperation between public and private, uh, too, uh, there will be in particular uh, requests for exchange of information between law enforcement, judges, and sports organization, and this is something that need uh, uh, legal uh, clarification. And then some issues regarding the regulation of uh, betting, uh, betting market, uh, that uh, players are prohibited to bet on their own competitions. Those are uh, measures that are so far mostly implemented through uh, regulation by the sports movement, but without some uh, legal backing, it's not possible to, to check whether those uh, measures are uh, implemented because uh, at some stage you, you need to have cooperation from the betting operators to make sure that uh, uh, they do not have uh, sports people among their customers and how can you access, you cannot expect the sports movement to access that kind of uh, information so there is a need for, for a legal arrangement to ensure this. Now I, I, would, I would shortly go through a recent major sports event and what kind of uh, new legislation uh, they, they brought. I have to say that all these uh, laws on uh, spectator violence, anti-doping, match fixing are not special requirements for major sports events. They are a uh, requirement for, to, to run sports events uh, in, in general. However, whenever, whenever countries uh, organize major sports events such as Olympic Games, uh, World Championship, they want to, to show state-of-the-art sports facilities, uh, best possible organization, and also they want to have the best uh, state-of-the-art uh, legislation on sport, and that's often the opportunity to update uh, the laws and to, 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 to make uh, progress on the sports legislation. And it was the case in Poland and Ukraine regarding uh, spectator violence, where they had new laws on uh, uh, public safety and uh, organization of uh, sport, football sports event. In the uh, London Olympic Games, uh, here it's an interesting case because United Kingdom is a country which is rather reluctant to, to, to adopt uh, laws uh, on uh, sports matters. They consider that uh, as far as possible it should be uh, ruled by uh, sports regulations and not by, uh, by, by law. However, there was a, an update of the uh, Gambling Act allowing exchange of information between sports organizations and betting operators. And there was also arrangement which were not legal to facilitate the fight against trafficking of uh, doping substances. 
in Sochi. Sochi was uh, an example on the fight uh, on the prevention of uh, safety and security issue, and in particular against uh, uh, the risk of uh, terrorist ter 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 terrorism. Uh, there was a, a cooperation with the federal custom, uh, uh, custom services uh, on uh, trafficking of uh, doping substances and allowing exchange of information between the sports organizers and the custom uh, officials. And there was a number of amendments on the law on physical culture on sport regarding uh, the risk of uh, match fixing, uh, prohibiting a bet on uh, their own competitions. Uh, requesting traceable means of payment for uh, beds, uh, reporting duty for betting operators, and, uh, and so on. I would like to uh, conclude with uh, some uh, practices w uh, which were a source of ins inspiration for uh, new recommendation or, or, or new standards uh, in the Council of Europe. And the uh, Euro 2004 in Portugal was uh, uh, the opportunity to develop good practices on uh, low profile uh, policing. Uh, police uh, officers we, who are very close to the crowd, uh, able to communicate, and not kind of a uh, robocop which are standing in the back and uh, uh, only ready to, to, to hit uh, offenders whenever they are uh, 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 offenses or uh, violent demonstration of uh, violence. Uh, the Euros 2004-2008 was uh, the opportunity to uh, develop uh, hospitality principles and uh, to, to develop uh, uh, new policies and laws on how to welcome uh, fans and uh, the public in, in uh, events. <coughs> in Germany, uh, the World Cup was the opportunity to develop know-how and good practices on public viewing areas. It was rather new at that time, but uh, uh, since uh, this uh, World Cup, there was a recommendation on public viewing uh, areas. And uh, the uh, Olympic Games of uh, London were uh, the opportunity to develop uh, the national platforms which are uh, gathering of uh, betting operators, sports movement, and, uh, and uh, law enforcement uh, authorities to detect uh, match fixing. And uh, the Sochi Games were also uh, the opportunity to, to experiment uh, that kind of uh, setting and to, to develop uh, those uh, good practices. So therefore, uh, whenever there is a, a major sport event is uh, the opportunity to develop uh, new practices and uh, new laws. It's often inspired by existing standards, either recommendation or convention from the Council of Europe or other international organization, but it's also the opportunity to develop uh, know-how uh, that will become uh, new standards or new, new recommendations or new uh, convention. And I also uh, would like to mention some uh, other areas which are not strictly sport-related, but where, where we had recommendation. It was uh, the case in a fight against uh, racism, where we, we had recommendation on the fight against racism in sports event, and the granting of uh, visas to athletes attending competition. This was also a source of in inspiration, and several countries now, whenever they have major sports events, they have a, a special program for granting of uh, visas to athletes. It's a requirement from the IOC for Olympic Games, but it's uh, more and more used even for all the kind of international competition. So thank you for your attention, and uh, that's uh, all for my presentation. I look forward to answering questions if there are. Questions, please, uh, to uh, Stanislav. I have a question, if um, you are still thinking about it. Uh, I have a question. When um, uh, we speak about major uh, sports events, not only our country, but other countries as well, they come across a situation when they uh, give uh, guarantees that these events will be held at a very uh, high level. But uh, this has nothing to do with uh, legal um, obligations. So these are like um, guarantees uh, uh, provided from the government to some uh, sports organizing uh, committee. Um, so this sometimes uh, leads to uh, difficulties in uh, internal uh, 
in, in, in streamlining this with internal regulations. My question is, is it possible somehow to take certain decisions that uh, will allow to uh, consider such declarations as documents of international law? Well, <laughs> this is a this is a very uh, tricky issue. But in general, I should say that uh, there is uh, no conflicting interest, and that uh, the requirement by sports organisations are uh, very much in line with the recommendations and the uh, international standards adopted by states and by public organisations. But sometimes there there is there are risks of uh, uh, interference in uh, the legislation of uh, the countries. And I, I, I may mention the example uh, of uh, the Netherlands, which was a, a candidate for, to host uh, the FIFA World Cup. And in the candidate uh, document uh, to, to host the FIFA World Cup, there was a, a confidential uh, appendix with the legal measures that uh, should be implemented by the uh, hosting country of the FIFA World Cup. And the uh, Dutch uh, government uh, did not agree to keep this uh, appendix confidential and they uh, decided to share it with the parliament as a, for the sake of uh, transparency and uh, democracy. And uh, it was not very uh, well appreciated by the uh, parliament uh, to have uh, the legislation dictated by uh, the international uh, sports organization. And there was uh, issues and scandals uh, in the press. And uh, of course, uh, this was not uh, pleasant for FIFA. And in the end, uh, the Dutch candidature was uh, not selected. So th this, is a, this, is, this is a risk, and uh, similarly, uh, well, we address the issue of uh, autonomy of sports movement, and we try to, uh, to respect the competencies of uh, uh, sports organization while uh, developing uh, policies on sport, but there is also a need to, to protect the uh, responsibility and the uh, competencies uh, of states, and so sometimes there may be a risk that uh, it can go too far uh, depending on the requirement of the uh, sports organizations uh, but uh, okay it's uh, it, it, it's it's discussed at political level it will be part of uh, the discussion in our ministerial meeting uh, in uh, in September but so far it was not a, a very uh, a, a very uh, high uh, problem in in most countries except uh, this uh, example I mentioned in the Netherlands Thank you very much. Uh, maybe uh, some other questions uh, to Stanislas, to your colleagues. Any questions? If not, okay, thank you very much. It has been a very interesting presentation. And I would like to uh, stress again that uh, we have been working very closely with our colleagues and with Stanislas. Uh, we work on that convention and we wish him all the best. Um, because this is important uh, yeah, to uh, fight um, uh, match uh, fixing and um, uh, the draft was uh, approved by the Council on Sports. And um, our next uh, speaker uh, will be Sergei uh, Shahrai. You, most of you probably know him very well. Uh, he's uh, one of the uh, authors of the only um, author of many important legal documents and now he is head of the Badminton Federation and he is head of the uh, Olympic uh, Committee uh, Legal uh, Department and um, thanks uh, to him our legislation in the area of sport with his assistance actually it, it all uh, started um, with him several years ago we were speaking that our sphere is not very well regulated and um, so we couldn't even discuss uh, sports uh, laws and now we can define it as a specific area thanks to all efforts taken by this uh, person. So, Sergei Mikhailovich, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Natalia Vladimirovna, for this uh, introduction. Okay, so I'll have to uh, shine uh, if you introduce me so highly. Okay, in my um, speech, I would like to touch upon two major uh, things. First of all, yes, it is uh, legal support and legal regulation in the area of major sports events. And the second area is uh, uh, priorities in development of a Russian national legislation in this sphere. And this will be my personal opinion. So speaking about the first item, I should say that uh, um, the Sochi Olympics experience uh, demonstrated that um, a lot should be taken on part of Russia and our partners to ensure security at such events. This uh, means that we have to limit um, certain rights of Russian citizens and um, foreign um, citizens and um, according in line with the Constitution any limitation should be regulated by a federal law. We have already experience that allows to unify uh, all these uh, constraints uh, to ensure that uh, law enforcing services um, work appropriately and uh, all uh, people attending uh, sports events are uh, protected and uh, if their rights are limited in certain way all this is um, already regulated and we have a very good law massive here yes we um, do uh, have agreements with um, many um, enforcement international agencies and um, if we speak about Russia, it is a huge country. When uh, we um, have uh, major events from Euro uh, somewhere in Vladivostok, it is very far away, our European colleagues don't want uh, to go there. They say it is very expensive. Maybe uh, it is necessary uh, to combine uh, some um, federal um, uh, support because if uh, it, uh, these events are at a uh, such high level maybe we need to attract some uh, private capital in order to uh, subsidize such events because um, very often um, those parts of Russia they lose um, lots of players and athletes because they don't even come uh, speaking about uh, major events like World Cups and Olympics and championships, we should have a clear-cut uh, procedure for visa-free or some easing uh, for uh, visa obtaining. Uh, so we don't have to invent um, something. So this should be clearly defined once and forever. And one more thing, the international uh, sports arbitration. This is an um, uh, institution which has great authority and reputation. I remember when Russian uh, badminton case um, was uh, considered. And um, after that, I wrote a book about international sports arbitration, and it is available in Russian and English. There was a problem which I believe uh, is um, in the area of international sports regulation. Every um, athlete has uh, to sign a certain document that all disputes with organizers of the Olympic Games um, or everything related uh, to uh, their participation should be considered by the International Arbitration Court. So on the one hand, they uh, do it themselves. Um, but on the other hand, if they don't sign it, then they won't be able uh, to uh, take part in the Olympic Games. Uh, lawyers, all lawyers know there is a, a number of uh, freedoms uh, that you cannot um, deny even if you sign a paper saying that you don't want to have this. And um, 
uh, these um, uh, athletes, for example, after signing this paper, uh, very often uh, they uh, cannot um, have a proper support in international um, arbitration organizations. I discussed it with the legal uh, department of our government, and uh, yes, uh, it is um, uh, an area. It is an area uh, of considering this. So if uh, athletes as individuals, uh, I'm not speaking about international organizations, so if athletes as individuals um, have a certain um, a dispute or a claim, then uh, it should there should be clear procedures for that. There is another issue, and I know that it is true not only for Russia, but it is quite common in Europe as well, because I communicate with colleagues from Europe a lot. And if, and uh, by the way, after this roundtable, uh, we are going to prepare recommendations that we are going to send to the government. We need to identify five to seven priority issues in the um, sports law area, uh, and uh, we can uh, prepare all these amendments, we can prepare uh, draft acts and so on. And uh, uh, that will be legal regulation, the sphere of sports. First, for Russia, uh, legal support of student sport is important uh, uh, to develop mass badminton at schools. Badminton will be the third lesson of physical training, so we had a uh, uh, a level at the Olympic Games and the student sports is a chain that is currently emitted and uh, not a single rector can uh, just uh, spend a copic to send uh, the team of his high school uh, to the competition. The financial auditor will come and say uh, that uh, you are not right. Having such an attitude, we uh, just uh, uh, spend six or six years of active sport age in vain, and uh, that is a real barrier to the results, to high results. Here we need regulation, financial regulation, primarily the relation that will, regulation that will make it possible for high schools using the approved procedure to develop the sports. In November, we'll uh, set up a student league on badminton in Kazan. Then on, uh, before the, the organizational events will be held, and being a member of the executive committee of the Olympic Committee, uh, I uh, will try to promote it. And secondly, second higher education for the Russian sportsmen, second higher education probably for, me, uh, for many sportsmen will become quite important from the viewpoint of a future profession. While he's a sportsman, uh, he will uh, be ascribed to a certain high school, but when uh, he comes to an end of the career, he needs to get some legal engineering or economic education, has to get to the second higher education, and according to our Russian legislature, he has to pay for it. Budgetary financing is prohibited. I presume that uh, uh, if a person is a member of the national team or a participant of the international uh, championship or Olympic Games, such sportsmen uh, have uh, to have the right to budgetary financing or co-financing from other sources of their second higher education and legal work is not so extensive. We have to join our efforts as a corporation and to promote uh, resolution of this problem. Thirdly, medical provision of sportsmen who uh, were traumatized at major international events. Trauma uh, during the competition is not a problem. There is an insurance. But if a person uh, becomes disabled for a long period of time, problems start. Believe me, we know snowboard or freestyle, a well-known sportsman who uh, suffered, who were injured seriously, and they cannot get uh, the necessary medical uh, provision at the budgetary institution of the Russian Federation. Often they need medical aid abroad. We also need to have the insurance mechanism so that the interests of the sportsmen will be defected. The problem of taxation Yes, everyone pays uh, a lot of money to the sportsmen if they have gold and medal, they receive cars. But each time I see that this is double or triple succession, and we need certain unification in that field and transparency, because this concerns millions of sports fans uh, who are watching uh, 
their favorites uh, who are in difficult uh, situations. And it has been uh, repeatedly mentioned, but they still uh, come across this problem when I uh, consider disputes at the sports arbitration court that is a relationship between labor legislation and civil law related uh, the relate, uh, regulating the relations between sportsmen, clubs, sportsmen, and federation. We have a lot of information. There is judicial and arbitration practice. Let us start working and uh, take some decisions that will be the general decision for our legislators. In Russia, we have unique conditions, and not only because we organize so many tournaments. The chairman of the State Duma is one of the heads of the Federation of Water Sports uh, Swimming, Mr. Narishkin. Uh, president of the Olympic Committee, the first vice speaker. They uh, are knowledgeable in the field of sports and there are deputies. That is normal lobbying. And if we address them, if we develop a set of documents and proposals, we can organize parliamentary hearings and then legislative initiative to advance these decisions. I think under such conditions, our round table will be not just a pleasant time spent with wonderful specialists, but will give some practical results on the four problems that I have outlined. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions to Sergei Mikhailovich? Please. Who will give the microphone? Marina Legumna, a professor of high school of economics. My question is like that. You said that the question of compensation of damage to the sportsmen who were injured when participating in the competitions or when preparing for the competitions, these problems are quite urgent because sometimes they need prosthesis or some other types of medical aid, they cannot be covered by the insurance uh, given by the sports organization through the Fund of Social Insurance. I would like to tell you that this is a problem not only for the sportsmen, this is a problem for everyone, but it has been solved in the following way. The law on obligatory medical insurance uh, that is currently being considered states that the compensation that is necessary for a citizen who was injured, and that is really the case because the uh, sportsman is equalized to an uh, employee, that law applies to him. And uh, there is additional insurance for the sportsman, but nevertheless, in such cases, when the funds, uh, there is a shortage of funds, the sportsmen can address the court of law and get compensation uh, through uh, the uh, legal proceedings uh, uh, from the sports organization with which he uh, was in labor relation. Or do you think that this is not sufficient? An additional mechanism is required in order to improve the situation, and probably even uh, uh, this can be done without addressing the court of law. I would like to know your opinion. Thank you for your question. Everything that you have been mentioning is really operating, uh, but you said that this is a, a complicated mechanism the sportsman uh, just uh, is uh, brought down to the level of the common citizen. What do I mean? What sports organization, uh, a lawsuit uh, against uh, what sports organization can be uh, started uh, to the Federation, to the International Olympic Committee, which organized the Olympic Games. It is not likely to the Ministry of Sports, to the Olympic Committee, that is not likely. Uh, for instance, as uh, to the medical treatment of the sportsmen in our country, that should be 
uh, sold by the federal and medical biological agency that is a strong organization with the budgetary financing, but according to the law, they cannot finance treatment of the uh, sportsmen abroad. You can change any clinic, uh, you can choose any clinic in Russia. As a result, our well-known sportsmen who became disabled uh, during freestyle uh, competition uh, uh, create their sites in the internet and asking for money for medical treatment. So uh, we need additional mechanisms in such cases which concern a small number of persons taking into account these two criteria. He is not just a member of the official national team, but during the official tournament he received uh, that uh, injury. Will it be additional insurance, or do we need some amendments to the law? This is for us, for the specialists, to decide. Yes, I agree with Sergei Mikhailovich. The theme is quite interesting. My question is, you spoke about student sports. Do you know that actually, when holding uh, the World uh, Universidad, the problem is that all, not all the uh, international federations uh, have an agreement with the International Federation of Student Sports, and hence the problem with participation of students, particularly of national teams, because for some international federations on different types of sports, participation in the world uh, is not an official sports event, and hence uh, there are cases when uh, the universe, uh, world Universidad is held and on the same days there will be world championships on the same types of sport and uh, the student will go to the official competition thus will lose uh, this student's movement how can this problem be solved uh, it exists at the international level and at the national level both Logically, it has a simple answer, but it, in fact, it is a, a difficult problem. Logical answer would be interaction within the framework of international sports organization and national organizations uh, to draw up the schedule of sports events. That means that the World and European Championship and Olympic Games should not coincide with the World Students Games and Students Competition. That is a simple answer. Uh, but uh, that is not so easily organized in practice because participation of our student uh, in uh, the uh, championship of the world is uh, financed and it is included into the schedule. As to the partition of the students' championship of Europe or Universal, is it goodwill or goodwill of the rector of the sponsors? Of course, uh, the sportsmen will go to an official event, so we have uh, to solve this problem to separate them. Thank you very much. Now we pass on to the next presentation. Our next presentation will be made by Nishat, Managing Director of Sport uh, Court International Convention. Recently in St. Petersburg, we held a wonderful Congress on, of Sport Accord, and Nishat is ready to make his presentation, please. Ms. Pasikova. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor to uh, be back in the Russian Federation and in particular in St. Petersburg. Allow me to, as Ms. Pajakova just did, uh, take you back a little year in time. So to the point uh, Ms. Pajikova just mentioned, we were in, I'm privileged to be in uh, St. Petersburg a year back with the uh, Sport Accord and Sport Accord Convention. The organization that I do represent is an umbrella organization that is responsible for combining all 109 international federations 
the Olympic organization, the recognized Olympic sports and the non-recognized Olympic sports. And what we did here in St. Petersburg, we met for six days. And as you could see from this little video here, it literally brings in all the important people, decision-making organs, individuals and persons in the world of sports of today. What I would like to spend a couple of minutes on now is, and I heard a lot of good comments being made from colleagues here in the panel about the uh, implementation of, of uh, legislation uh, in, within the world of sports. However, what I would like to talk a little bit about is the contract, because we are amongst a lot of lawyers and legal people here today. And the thing about the contract or the host contract for any event is that when we look at the contract as such, and I've just randomly now put up three contracts, which is basically the same. Apart from one of these up here was in Russian, so the language was a little bit different than that was the contract that we did for St. Petersburg last year. Now, the point about the contracts and the host city agreements or any agreement within uh, sports, that is that when a city or a country is in the process of bidding for an event, be that a convention like we did last year in St. Petersburg, be that the Olympics or any major event, there is a huge interest in attracting this event to the nation or to a city. Now, what we need to realize and be aware of is that the minute, as I say, the pen has been put to the paper and the contract is signed, there is a total shift in power. So coming from a city that wants the event and an organizer who wants to give away the event, the minute the paper is signed, the whole thing changes. So that brings me on to talking a little bit about the process behind this agreement. For obvious reason, there can be an open bidding process, which we know in many cases, and there can also be a closed one. And what one needs to consider between those two is that, of course, when you have an open bidding process taking place, that means that it is transparent, everybody knows what goes on, and of course there are upsides to that, but the downside could also be that it is not necessarily given for the right reasons. Opposed to if you have a closed process taking place and you determine on that, it might be the end result is actually better for the event and also for the city or the nation hosting the event. If we move into the more detailed level of looking at an agreement, it is from my point of view very, very important that there are clear expectations in the documents and the process so the candidates who are bidding for an event, major sporting event, from, as you say, the get-go is aware of the expectations, not just on the one side but on both sides. So it's really important that roles, rights and responsibilities on both sides are clearly defined. Don't promise too much. Be realistic in what you ask for, because if you go out and promise too much, you might wind up in a situation where either the city or the host nation is actually not in a situation to deliver. And further down the road, if a country has a growth vision of attracting major sporting events, it might further down the road also damage the possibility of that nation or country to actually host future sporting events. And for obvious reasons, it's very, very important to conduct a number of visits throughout the planning process, not just to see if the physical venue can do it, but also if the mindset on both parties and both sides are the right one. Le and from a legal perspective, it is very important to have, I would say, all tools in the toolbox ready in case something goes wrong. Because we've all been living and breathing major events coming out of a very successful Sochi um, just recently. 
But we also know that once, as I said in the beginning, once the contract has been awarded to any city or nation, it is almost, when we talk big international events, it is almost unthinkable if something goes wrong that we say we are not going to go anyway. It's not to point fingers, but it is publicly available. We all know what the IOC recently have been saying about the 2016. The evaluation committee there, they're hugely concerned, but still it is unthinkable to go to Brazil and say, listen, we are going to take it away from you because we are concerned. Equally important, do not necessarily try to eliminate all risks when these big complex contracts and hosting agreements are made. Because if it becomes a one-way street in the contract, it is likely that the host, in case of any disagreement, then you, went, you end up in a situation where it is very difficult to actually resolve the issues within the contract if it is just, we want this, do this, do that. However, the agreements should be flexible and it should also reflect the respect and mutual understanding between both sides. <clears throat> A little bit on the financial guarantees to consider is it is cross guarantees uh, between the host and the government. However, where is the guarantee actually coming from when we look at the finances? Is it coming from the government level? Is it coming from a local level? Is it coming from state, province, or even from, in some cases, from the National Olympic Committee or private entities? When making these agreements, it is super important that this responsibility is clear from the very first day, so you do not wind up in a legal battle further down the road, sitting and discussing who should actually be paying for the services rendered, which links into bank guarantees, adequate insurances in case of a breach. And as uh, our colleague from, from the Russian Olympic Committee mentioned before, um, there are issues that need to be generally resolved. One was the visa issue that was mentioned before. Another one really important is cost and clearance when we come uh, into different parts of the world. To give a small example of that, the International Judo Federation two weeks back in time hosted a, a big uh, tournament in Cuba. Everything was fine until they arrived at customs and then everything went wrong. So there are things to consider when actually we move into the more detailed planning and implementation of the contract. So in summary, the whole city agreement or the agreement with any nation that should be solid and understandable. We should make sure that the agreement is flexible and fair. And in my mind, once the lawyers have done their legwork and homework and the contract is signed, the key success to making the contract come live and to have a success for any nation host city on major sporting event is that there is a strong and respectful connection between the host and the organizer. And with that, I rest my case. I think the wording is, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Any questions, please? Are there any questions straight away? I have the following question. Could you please um, tell us um, uh, international organizations determine uh, many different conditions for um, a certain events, and they might be very different. Sometimes uh, they, uh, these uh, conditions become part of the national laws, and sometimes they are part of international law. At the same time, uh, certain requirements uh, for example, they do not correspond to international conventions like labor convention or other uh, conventions or similar uh, documents. What happens in this way? Uh, because you have a very rich experience. What if certain requirements to sports events do not correspond to international documents like conventions? Okay. 
it's a very, very good uh, question. And, and again, I don't want to finger point any uh, sporting event that is upcoming. We probably all know them. Um, but at this day in time, there is no common denominator within the contracts and how contracts are made across nations. Um, and again, I think what it does is it brings me back to my point from before that contracts need to be rock solid, they need to be well thought through, but on both sides, both the host and the organizer, it needs to be discussed up front what are the issues, and we've talked a lot about illegal betting, anti-doping, and what have you, and even down to human rights when we talk about labor. But it needs to be defined from the very early start when a city, a nation, and an organizer is talking about having a major event, that all these different elements, moving components, are captured in this document and then put into that, and milestone deliveries are put in place so you can sit and monitor and track on it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I heard the answer, and I believe, uh, as we will, uh, need uh, uh, this in our experience. Yes, we have to pay a great deal of attention to agreements between host nations and organizers. But when um, some nation submits um, a bid, uh, then uh, at the same time, uh, they have to submit a draft agreement where they um, demonstrate how they uh, see implementation of all the requirements proposed by the organization. Your um, organization, Sport Accord, because you uh, organize so many events, um, maybe we can organize a forum, some conference, and discuss these issues, because we are ready to prepare a presentation with our questions and issues. That is um, definitely something we would uh, welcome to sit together and uh, discuss uh, things like this for the future, absolutely. And I must say also being here in St. Petersburg and being invited for this uh, forum, it is um, it's a very good forum and there are definitely things that I would like to, to bring back home to Switzerland and to discuss uh, with my people in how to work mutually together uh, on these things and also as the gentleman from the uh, Russian Olympic Committee mentioned before there were already things starting to emerge in my mind that I would like to very much be involved with or at least have a opportunity to offer my, my views uh, on it um, but it would be wonderful to have the opportunity of working together with the Russian Federation on, on defining this within the sport accord and, and what we're doing Absolutely. Thank you very much that you support this initiative, initiative of the Russian Federation to discuss uh, these uh, issues because this refers not only to our country, but um, from a studying experience of other countries, and uh, I'm speaking about major events, we see that other countries also face certain problems. Okay, the floor is over uh, to our colleague. And Alexei Mikhailovich was speaking uh, a lot about uh, the importance of the um, arbitration uh, court, court of arbitration for sport, and it has great power in um, a disputes resolution and experience of uh, this organization is not very well known in Russia because we very uh, seldom go to this court. So the floor is over. The professor of Milano University, member of the Court of Arbitration for Sport, director of SLRC Sports Law Research Center, Lucio Colantuoni. Thank you very much for the organizers because 
having invited me to this uh, very interesting uh, opportunity to exchange views about uh, international sports law. And I think that uh, uh, meetings like this could be very beneficial for the, for the world of uh, international sports. Um, I'm here today uh, to speak uh, not only as a CAS arbitrator, uh, there are a lot of issues that have been raised in the, uh, in the speeches of uh, our colleagues today that has a lot to do with uh, the activity of the CAS uh, in Lausanne, where I'm uh, very, let's say, happy to be a, a member of the list of the arbitrators and mediators. Uh, some of them are becoming uh, uh, very important uh, and uh, are becoming of paramount importance for the existence itself uh, of the, the international uh, uh, sport organizations. Uh, not only doping, and doping will be the main focus of my speech today, but uh, of course uh, violence, because out of violence uh, come, come out uh, a lot uh, of uh, discussion about sanctions and how those sanctions could be beneficial to the world of the uh, sport organizations because sometimes, and that is uh, uh, very unhappily uh, an experience also in my country, uh, those uh, violent hooligans can threaten the sport clubs uh, trying to obtain some, uh, let's say, uh, benefits from the clubs. Uh, the sanctions could be uh, some way uh, proportioned, but also they should be uh, effective. The other main, main issue is, of course, uh, match fixing. Match fixing, in the, in the words uh, of the past president of the IOC, is maybe a cancer that is much more uh, dangerous for sports than doping. Um, widespread all over the world, a huge amount of money that uh, turns around the match fixing, and match fix fixing is uh, uh, widely also uh, going into the, let's say, less, uh, um, less uh, diffused uh, uh, sporting activities and less uh, well known uh, not only in the sports that are under the spot but uh, match fixing is much more dangerous in the uh, in the grassroots sports and uh, I think that uh, uh, kind of uh, reaction of the world of uh, uh, the international sports organizations could be and should be basically in those activities in those fields. Um, today, uh, having to do with the, the main aspects uh, of uh, uh, the legal issues uh, uh, for the organization of sporting events, mm -hmm. I think it's quite interesting to, to have a look uh, more in details in the, the issues uh, related with uh, the doping and anti-doping policies that must be put in place uh, when, uh, uh, the, when, the, when organizing a special event. A special event not only uh, at the Olympic level, but also at the international federation level, at the continental federation level, because uh, uh, the, 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 the fight against doping should be uh, constructed in a, a very complex way and uh, in order to obtain uh, better results for the benefits of the, of the sports in general. Um, just to begin with, uh, let's say, kind of uh, uh, update uh, uh, issue, um, I, I received an update from the FIFA World Cup uh, uh, press uh, release, and uh, today there is a press release about uh, the anti-doping controls at FIFA World Cup in uh, Brazil. Uh, the interesting issue is that uh, for the first time before the FIFA World Cup, 800 athletes were tested with blood and urine, and at the moment, no positive result. 
this is the most uh, important and diffused analysis uh, testing of, uh, uh, for doping control that ever happened in a major event. Uh, the policy of uh, FIFA is uh, to go, go on with this kind of uh, controls during the games, of course, because not only before, but also during the games, uh, there should be, there could be uh, issues about uh, positivity. And uh, the other very important issue is that FIFA is backing very much the so-called biological passport. And the biological passport, uh, from the scientific point of view, but also from the legal and from the um, arbitral point of view, is one of the main issues that we are facing from now to the future. Uh, the biological passport is, from the legal point of view, a, a change, a radical change in the the way uh, you can sanction uh, doping, because it is not only uh, the, the fact that you are uh, deceiving the presence of the substance, not only that you, are, that you have proof, direct proof, about the methods or uh, substances, this is uh, a very much more wide control about uh, the, 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 the life of athletes and the way they behave mainly out of competition. So I think that uh, having FIFA fighting doping this way in the, in the World Cup, so in competition, the most important competition after the, the Olympics and out of competition could be a, a very interesting uh, uh, point, uh, not only point uh, for starting for the other major international uh, bodies and federations. But uh, my, my point, of, uh, point of view about uh, the fight uh, against doping and what I want to share with you, may I have the remote control, please, <laughs> for the slides? Um, is something that, uh, thank you, thank you very much, is uh, the combination between uh, the sporting regulations and the criminal laws that could be enacted at the national level and how this combination is uh, a positive combination and uh, how it can become an interference. But that interference must be dealt from the regulatory point of view and mainly from the point of view of the cooperation between the world of sport and uh, the uh, public bodies and, uh, of course, the legislation and the police authorities. Uh, just a few words about uh, uh, the, the, the fight against uh, doping. Uh, we have uh, now in place uh, the very important uh, activity by the WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency. Uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency is now uh, enacting the new code, the new WADA code, that will uh, come in force in 2015. That code now is uh, much more detailed and much more effective. There are a lot of new issues that are related to the 2015 uh, WADA code. Uh, we, we don't have the time now to discuss about that. But one of the points that I want to uh, underline is that the new WADA code is uh, adopting some of the uh, methods to to discover and to fight doping that uh, were uh, enacted in different uh, legislations and uh, mainly from the criminal point of view. But what is the situation uh, at the national level and uh, I, my continent, Europe, our continent, uh, regarding the harmonization of the legislation, uh, of the criminal legislation about doping? The situation is a situation that is uh, 
very much uh, um, different from state to state, not only because there are a lot of, uh, of nations that still don't have a specific legislation about the fight uh, uh, against the doping, but also because those states that do have a legislation have a legislation that is deeply different and dif deeply different from the criminal point of view and the way that uh, those criminal laws uh, try to combat, try to fight uh, doping through investigation. Um, I think following what uh, our colleague, uh, our colleague from the uh, Council of Europe uh, was saying before, the role of uh, the authorities at the European level uh, should be very important and very beneficial. Uh, I think that the Council of Europe uh, is of course uh, the body that is doing more in order to have uh, a harmonization of the policies. Uh, at the European Union level, there are much more problems regarding the competence, the competence, the specific competence of the European Union and the Commission about the harmonization of criminal laws. That has to do, of course, with much more, let's say, important issues about uh, the fight against crimes uh, within Europe, but comes to the sports and comes to the doping because often doping is related with the, the so-called uh, organized crime. And as I said, sport is involved uh, mostly for the match fixing in combination with the, the organized crime. So it is something that uh, should be done even at that, uh, at that specific level. Um, I don't think we have uh, uh, time to go in details uh, within the single legislations. I give you the example of the Italian one because I think uh, it is uh, very interesting, not only because uh, it is one of the first criminal laws that were enacted in the world, but also because we, we have uh, two very uh, specific uh, uh, points. One is that the Italian legislation is now more or less uh, the model for some, some parts from some issues that are now uh, in, uh, in place in the new WADA code that was following the Italian uh, background and the Italian uh, anti-doping uh, legislations and regulations. The second aspect is that uh, we had a very interesting experience in Italy about uh, the uh, interaction and as I said, sometimes interference between the sports regulations and the, state re and the state laws in the occasion of a major event that was the uh, Winter Olympic Games in uh, Turin 2006. And I think that is uh, a very, very good example how nations could uh, face and uh, manage this kind of situation when we, we are thinking about the organization of a main, of a major event in a, in a country. Uh, I don't want to, uh, to speak about uh, the, the details of the Italian legislation, but I want only to, uh, to outline what was uh, this kind uh, of uh, um, uh, interaction uh, in the Winter Olympic Games. First of all, the criminal law dated back to the year 2000, number 376, uh, is a very um, complex criminal law. Uh, we have uh, crimes uh, 
related to doping, if you want, you can find it in, uh, in my, in my uh, presentation. Uh, that were not so well uh, uh, seen by the Olympic uh, Committee, the International Olympic Committee and the National Olympic Committee. So far that uh, uh, there was also the request of suspending the efficacy of the uh, criminal law during the Olympic Games. Um, that, uh, that suspension didn't happen. Uh, there was only a kind of cooperation between the authorities because uh, the specific commission that uh, is supervising the activity of uh, investigation uh, for uh, the criminal law uh, became part of uh, the commission for investigation for the Olympic Committee. And so there was, uh, let's say, kind of uh, very strict cooperation between the two uh, authorities. But the, the criminal law was in place and uh, the results were very interesting because uh, first, for the first time uh, during the, the Olympic Games, there was an increase in investigation and uh, in uh, the search for, uh, for doping that was uh, more than 70% uh, higher than the, than the uh, previous Olympic Games. So the difference in uh, search due to the fact that there was that interaction between the criminal law and the criminal authorities and uh, the sports regulations was an increase of 73% between Lake Placid and uh, uh, Turin 2006. And uh, mm, there were some, uh, some issues related to positivity, but not only, some issues related to the presence of uh, methods. The second, the presence of uh, methods that were found uh, in the uh, in the Olympic Village uh, where the Austrian cross-country uh, team uh, was, is a typical example of investigation that could have been done only through the criminal law and the criminal investigations. Because we know that uh, the, sport, uh, the sport authorities don't have the possibility to search and to search that kind of uh, uh, materials, uh, drugs. So this is very, very interesting. The second, uh, the second uh, issue uh, during the Olympic Games, unfortunately, was uh, a Russian case, the case of uh, a cross-country athlete, Olga Pileva, that was found positive uh, for a substance that uh, for the Russian uh, legal uh, authorities, for the Russian Olympic Committee, uh, was due to a um, wrong interpretation of uh, the, the contents of a specific uh, uh, medicine that shouldn't have contained that substance. But from the other side, there was uh, the, creel, uh, the real uh, uh, objective uh, presence of the, sum, of the substance. Uh, I don't want to comment uh, the, the case from the sporting authorities' point of view. I want only to uh, outline how the case was dealt. The case was dealt uh, with the, the usual uh, quick and maybe summary uh, uh, procedure during the games, so that the athlete was immediately suspended. Uh, she was taken the 
silver medal. So it was a very, very, very hard sanction for, for her. Then, after the games, she went through the, uh, the procedure. And uh, at the end uh, of this procedure that went to, to our uh, arbitration court, so it went to the CAS, uh, the, the sanction was uh, confirmed. What is interesting is that uh, a, a, a similar procedure uh, went on at uh, the criminal court point of, uh, point of view, uh, the criminal court of uh, Torino, where a very famous uh, public prosecutor is, uh, is acting. And uh, uh, at the end, uh, the, the result from the criminal point of view was uh, similar. Uh, the athlete was sanctioned and was sanctioned with uh, a, uh, uh, a fine, but also with uh, imprisonment. The athlete didn't go to prison, of course, first because uh, the, uh, the level of the sanction was not, let's say, enough. There were a lot of uh, uh, excuses. And then the second aspect is that at the end of the procedure, we are speaking about a procedure that lasted five years. So can we pretend that after five years, an athlete could be sanctioned with a criminal sanction that could be also imprisonment? I think that this is something that we must uh, think about. So um, going to kind of uh, Let's say, conclusion. Uh, is it beneficial for the sports to have uh, such uh, hard sanctions, criminal sanctions, that are first enacted by different nations in different ways, like you know, a jeopardy of uh, criminal laws that make uh, the world of sports a kind of uh, Mm, uh, very complex uh, uh, jigsaw. Uh, it is quite uh, surprising that there could be kind of uh, forum shopping for uh, international events. <laughs> so major events could not be hosted in countries where there is a very hard uh, prosecution ag against uh, doping. Should be the opposite. So the event should take place and the controls should be uh, effective. The other conclusion is uh, that it is not uh, a problem of uh, reaching the same result that is a result of conviction uh, or suspension from the different point of views. Uh, the sports authorities should have their own power to go and to go to their conclusions from the sporting point of view. Uh, now there is also kind of uh, more detailed uh, uh, interference between uh, the investigations and, uh, the, uh, and uh, the enactment of uh, the uh, sporting procedure. What is interesting is that uh, um, the two regulations should, should be uh, constructed in order to have a very, a very, uh, uh, a very good cooperation between uh, the authorities. A very good cooperation because it is uh, through cooperation and through a kind of uh, harmonization between the two, the, the two kind of, uh, of uh, regulations, of laws, that could be the, the, main, uh, the main results. Last issue, timing. Of course, uh, criminal uh, procedures are not ready to, to be so time effective like the, the sporting ones. But uh, in these specific uh, subjects, there should be, in my opinion, 
special courts, special courts having to do with these specific uh, crimes uh, in order to, to give the widest and strongest support to the, the world of sport. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Are there any questions to our colleagues? Please, please take the microphone. I would like to thank uh, Professor for a very interesting presentation and I have several questions. As to anti-doping, uh, combating doping, everyone recognizes the importance of this process and in many countries they have instituted criminal responsibility. On the other hand, there is a question uh, how this uh, parallel system of law enforcement should operate. It is clear that from the viewpoint of standards, of the proofs and the duties of law enforcement bodies on proving the uh, guilt uh, of the sportsman in criminal procedures, they are different, uh, unlike the sports uh, sphere. We can analyze different cases as to the sports sanctions and deprivation of the medals if doping has been recorded. There is a certain presumption of being guilty. And uh, in uh, criminal proceedings, we have the presumption of being not guilty. What should we do in a situation if doping was found uh, during the sporting procedure, the sports arbitration court recognized that this uh, doping is present and he is deprived of the medal. The criminal proceedings start with investigation, but in the criminal proceedings it is proved that the sportsman is not guilty. Can in that case the decision taken by the core, uh, sports court can, uh, can it be revised? I mean the deprivation of the medal. Thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, uh, it is true that, uh, that mm, those different uh, legislations have different principles of law and uh, uh, some of them have also different principles about uh, the, the burden of proof and about uh, the, the liability of the athletes, not only. Uh, one thing that uh, uh, I didn't mention in my presentation, but I, I want to say uh, now uh, due to your uh, comments, is that uh, uh, the, the criminal law is able to, uh, to fight uh, not on the, the doping not only from the inside of sport, but also uh, trying to fight what is uh, around sports that is uh, trafficking. Trafficking is the, the most uh, important and relevant uh, aspect of criminal liability of people that are, uh, let's say, profiting from sports in order to make their own, uh, uh, their own uh, uh, crimes. And so fighting trafficking through the criminal law is uh, one of the, the main issues. From the burden of proof point of view, um, we have uh, a um, jurisprudence at CAS that is uh, a jurisprudence that, that uh, is uh, very slightly uh, different from the criminal uh, uh, law point, point of view. We have a jurisprudence uh, that is uh, the comfor comfortable satisfaction of the court slightly less than the, the civil, uh, than the criminal, slightly more than the civil uh, liability. Now under the new WADA code, uh, there are uh, a, a lot of interesting points that, uh, that now are on stage because uh, just in two words, the sanction is, uh, uh, is now higher it comes up to four years of suspension, but there are a lot more of uh, possibility for the athlete to prove the non-intention to, uh, to, 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 to use the, the substance or the, or, the, or, the, or the drug. 
so also the burden of proof is going, uh, is going to change. Thank you. Any further questions, please? No, President of the Chamber of Commerce and Chairperson of the Sports Arbitration at the Chamber of Trade and Commerce and cases related to doping are familiar to us. Don't you think that uh, when combating doping in the sports environment that uh, sports sanctions should prevail? Lifelong suspension or disqualification for the sportsman will kill him till the end of the life. And legal sanctions, uh, you have already mentioned that uh, that is combating with the doping trafficking and with those dirty people who are trafficking and delivering dopey substances and who get profit due to that. My question is, we remember the games in Torino and criminal proceedings. Where else except Italy they have such stringent criminal law that concerns not only people surrounding doping, but sportsmen as well? Thank you. Uh, yes, of course, this is a, a major problem, a major issue. And uh, that makes the difference uh, uh, in the way the single uh, nations are trying to, to fight uh, doping. Uh, quite, uh, I, I don't say in uh, opposition, but uh, in, uh, with a very, very interesting distinction between the sports regulations and the legislation. That is the, the key, the key uh, subject, the athlete. So if you uh, hardly sanction the athlete, uh, very difficult to have the athlete cooperating uh, in the uh, discovery of uh, the world of people that are going around the, the, sport, uh, the sport activity, the criminals that are acting in, uh, around the sports. But of course, if you don't sanction the athlete, you don't reach the result that is uh, having a clean and equal competition. So I think it is a very difficult choice, no? Uh, because if doping is, uh, uh, is, is uh, the fight against doping has uh, two basic uh, reasons. One is uh, the health, the health of the, of the athletes. And the second is the health of the competition. So the equal and fair competition, you should, you must, uh, sanction the athlete. But if you sanction the athlete, you can't have the result to have the athlete cooperating for the discovery of uh, what is uh, around. Now there is in the new WADA code, of course, a, also a, a new regulation about uh, the effective cooperation. And that is a way for uh, reducing the, the sanction. But the cooperation must be effective. <laughs> that is the point. It is not only, yes, I did. It is, yes, I did. This, this and this colleague did also. And that doctor, that manager helped us or obliged us to do that. Where else, in what countries, they have similar stringent regulation uh, of uh, criminal law in respect of sportsmen, except Italy, and what other countries? In this respect, uh, Italy is now uh, maybe the, the only country where we, we have such uh, a, a deep and uh, effective specific criminal law related to doping. Uh, we had before the law of 2000, of the year 2000, a situation similar to other countries, I think quite similar to, to your country, that is uh, fighting doping through a general legislation about uh, health and uh, uh, sport competition. Uh, it was not so much effective and, uh, for example, we had a couple of very important uh, uh, criminal cases uh, related to cyclism, 
cyclism in, in Italy is uh, very important. And uh, those uh, cases were dealt with the old legislation and uh, uh, it, it didn't work. And I, I think that a specific legislation about uh, doping should be enacted, but having the, the aim to, to have it uh, uh, harmonized at the international level. I'm going also to respond. Apart from Italy, the criminal law, uh, Italy is the only country where they have criminal um, law in this uh, area of doping. In other countries, those uh, athletes who have been disqualified and sanctioned by international federations uh, because of their they, they um, don't have any right to compete further. So um, very often um, it is viewed that because their human rights have already been limited and uh, we cannot um, punish them again through criminal laws. In uh, Russia, criminal laws are not applicable to athletes themselves, but they can be used in relation to those people who assisted this person in getting these uh, substances. This is a very interesting uh, topic, and anti-doping area and fighting, yes, it touches upon human rights of people, and um, anti-doping uh, convention, it uh, contains um, direct um, requirements in the area of human rights violation and athletes not only in Russia but all over the world they have to supply uh, personal data if they travel and uh, they also um, are obliged uh, to meet inspectors and to give uh, all these tests of course, no one um, speaks about human rights in this respect. And even uh, this idea of biological passport, if we speak about protection of uh, personal data, we sort of forget about it. Sport is such a special area where we admit uh, there can be norms uh, which uh, violate other international law norms. And I was um, discussing it with uh, Nis Hutt. Uh, we uh, need uh, to uh, stay within internationally accepted norms. On the one hand, we try to protect uh, human rights. And on the other hand, in sports, there are such uh, problems and uh, we shouldn't be embarrassed um, and we should discuss them openly. Sometimes we go ahead of international law in certain respects and somewhere we lag behind. I believe this will be discussed um, in future at different um, panel discussions. We have two more speakers. Uh, we have um, about 15, uh, 20 minutes. I have two more uh, speakers, two colleagues from our academy, uh, Lig uh, Moscow Legal Academy. This is the dean, dean of uh, sports law faculty, um, Mr. Rogachev, and uh, his uh, colleague, uh, secretary um, of the International Association of uh, Sports Law, Olga Shevchenko, who's going to speak first? Dennis, you probably. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, yeah, I'll try to fit in six minutes. First of all, I would like to say that uh, Russia has a lot to be proud of in sports regulation because we, unlike uh, many other countries, we have a specialized uh, federal law in this area, and now we have two um, uh, laws on major sports events, one uh, for Sochi Olympics and the other, it was adopted in June last year. This is for World Cup of 2018. 
we have special ministry of sport. Again, not every country can say that they have a special ministry devoted to this. We also have federal targeted uh, program of sports development. And uh, um, there's a lot of money um, assigned for that. And there are many other um, facts uh, that demonstrate that the Russian Federation is very much keen on sports development and it provides support, uh, great support. And this is thanks to the president and the minister of sports, Mr. Mutko, and the whole team of specialists who help to uh, preserve this model and um, thanks to uh, you, uh, Natalia Pashikova, as well. Speaking about regulation at the level of international, high level, uh, international events, in uh, some countries uh, they have um, specialized laws. In some countries uh, they don't have anything special. In Germany, for example, they didn't have any special um, uh, acts or bylaws. Uh, they uh, just used their uh, regular uh, legislation. And as we heard today, in Poland and Ukraine, uh, they adopted um, a special laws um, for uh, Euro um, Cup uh, 2012. South Africa adopted a special law. China, they also adopted a special law uh, about the Olympic Games. In every law, there was something uh, special. There were unique uh, pearls uh, that could be interesting for Russia, for example. You know, sometimes we are even surprised by some norms. In South Africa, for example, so uh, FIFA was exempt uh, from all taxes, but uh, there was um, a tax uh, on uh, plastic bags. Uh, and in China, uh, for example, uh, there was a special a court uh, that um, was um, working with all um, uh, sports um, facilities and uh, all disputes with contractors or so on, uh, it was all covered by this uh, special court in Brazil. Uh, there is an interesting uh, norm. Uh, one article says that the government uh, may um, announce may announce as public holidays the days when their team is playing. We don't have this norm in the Russian legislation. Or, for example, the norm um, about uh, schools, educational establishments of Brazil, secondary schools and universities, so they can move as uh, their holidays um, so that students don't have any tests or exams uh, during the time of the World Cup. We don't have uh, this norm here, and I'm not sure we really need it, but we can discuss it in future. Yeah, we need to check it with volunteers working here. And going back to Russia. Russia in the past uh, maybe eight to ten years, we have uh, learned a lot in the area of sports law and we borrowed some experience from other countries uh, in the area of major events regulation, International Olympic um, Committee, FIFA and so on. Uh, quite um, modern amendments that were introduced into our laws uh, in the anti-doping regulation that was uh, with the WADA agency and the International Olympic Committee. That was a success of our legislation and we are fully in line with international standards and we are now off the black list of countries uh, where they don't have systemic uh, legal mechanisms for fighting uh, doping. Then in preparation to the World Cup of 2018, uh, an, an article was introduced uh, that uh, covers all organizers of events, and uh, this article protects uh, them from um, unlawful uh, competition. For example, uh, this is about protection of uh, symbols of um, the event and uh, um, protection of the right to be associated with um, this event and so on. This is part of the uh, governmental uh, guarantees that were given to FIFA and so on. And this is true for any uh, sort of organizers of any event. We also, and uh, Natalia Vladimirovna was speaking about it, um, this year uh, we had uh, lots of amendments uh, 
uh, related to uh, security of uh, sports events. This is a huge amount of work. And uh, there are so many bylaws which are still at the level of um, approval and discussion. But uh, the basis of this uh, work against violence, uh, it is in line with the international experience. Uh, there are blacklists of spectators, of fans who um, had uh, committed uh, something wrong. And also Russia uh, started using Quite interesting international experience. This is a state monopoly for lotteries, uh, sport uh, lotteries. And um, we, we, we actually didn't believe in um, our victory, but Russia uh, decided to return this monopoly after more than 20 years. And now only two uh, state uh, bodies in Russia can organize uh, lotteries, sports lotteries. It is the Ministry of Sport, and then they can use this money only for specific purposes, and the Ministry of Finance. So this is a serious step forward, and maybe in future we can discuss bookmakers' activities and gambling, sports gambling, maybe um, in uh, some uh, distant future the same model will be used for uh, sports gambling and bookmakers because they don't help sport at all. They don't uh, pay any uh, duties or they don't uh, help sport at all. They are like uh, parasites and they uh, feed off uh, sport. And um, I would like to uh, stress that a community of exp experts uh, support the idea expressed by the uh, Deputy Miss Minister, uh, Mrs. Pashikova, about some common norms for international sports events uh, in Russia. Um, maybe it should be a different uh, law or a uh, part of the existing law. It doesn't matter. But the model which um, is um, there, then it will enable us uh, to be absolutely clear and transparent about all uh, uh, procedures. Uh, this includes application for hosting different events because uh, there's co-financing um, issue and also uh, governmental guarantees that uh, should be provided, um, public uh, co-financing of all preparation activities. And this is quite costly uh, in terms of time and money, and it is quite uh, logical uh, to have uh, uh, certain minimal uh, standards for uh, supporting uh, such events uh, without uh, specific reference uh, to um, FIFA or uh, Olympic events. And now, uh, speaking about other uh, success of um, Russia, I believe that our laws can uh, become models for other countries. I'm not um, uh, going to compare us with France, where they have a sports uh, code, but I'm speaking about other countries where it is not so well developed. For example, Russia can be proud uh, of an article in the labor code which is devoted to work of coaches and athletes. And I believe this approach uh, where we regulate it um, in this perspective. I believe it is uh, very positive and uh, can be uh, shared with colleagues. Also, in the law on sport, there is a big um, article devoted to the rights of organizers, and this is uh, the right to determine who will um, compete, the right to have uh, sponsors, um, a right to have broadcast, uh, broadcasting of uh, these events. I know that in other countries, uh, for example, TV broadcasting, this is never regulated in the uh, civil code or in any other. Uh, laws, and uh, they use uh, only existing practices, uh, but not um, legal norms. Probably we should raise an issue about creating a, of, uh, uh, some international uh, charter 
aiming at support of uh, sports in general, uh, globally, and not uh, only um, within the Council of Europe, but maybe um, under UNESCO or the United Nations. And in this convention or charter, there can be minimal uh, requirements to countries um, so that sport should be uh, developed at the primary and secondary school level. There should be some tax exemptions for children's um, sports clubs. Also, that there should be a criminal norms against uh, match fixing and so on and so forth. I believe we should uh, start uh, and initiate a discussion of this topic and maybe in five or seven years uh, we uh, will be able to agree on a document that which uh, will be accepted by uh, different countries. And a couple of words about problems, just a couple of minutes, about um, problems relevant uh, to international events. And this is not well regulated yet. I should say that international uh, club um, games like basketball or uh, FIFA uh, World Cups, uh, these are not well uh, regulated in uh, bylaws. And there are certain problems. For example, speaking about manipulation of result. So we have a, like a calendar plan with official, official sports events, and there is some support uh, in line with this uh, plan. And uh, speaking um, about games uh, organized by uh, such international clubs and associations, we don't have enough support to that. We also lack. Um, uh, regulation um, related to the status of uh, national teams and the members of these national teams. And again, I would like experts to provide their proposals on that. Speaking about security in sport, here we... Uh, the government and the ministries are working with the bylaws. One of the bylaws are technical requirements to all sports facilities where the official competitions are held. I would like to ask in public, uh, since the document is uh, developed by the Internal Affairs Ministry, uh, the uh, meetings have uh, shown that uh, it is overburdened with financial issues. Uh, those uh, requirements in respect of security to any uh, sports facility, for instance, a small uh, stadium in the city, it is quite uh, expensive to have video cameras and premises for the police, uh, the, uh, for the emergency, uh, for AmerCom and Federal Security Service. So the expenses in this case might be quite significant. And the last statement, uh, uh, sports, uh, just uh, meetings or organization, probably in Russia in future, uh, will uh, uh, sport uh, disputes. Uh, probably in Russia we have some replacement for Lausanne, Lausanne uh, uh, disputes because they are meant for international events. As to the national disputes, they shouldn't be submitted to uh, such a level that will be strategically wrong. We have to discuss it with the representatives of the Chamber of Trade and Industry, Ministry of the Justice, uh, the new wording of the law and arbitration is being prepared. So we have to think about it so that the dispute will be considered in Russian and it will be less expensive and done in Russian, not in Lausanne. Thank you, Olga Alexander. Will you please supplement your colleague? And then probably we'll ask some questions and answers. Thank you very much. Without repeating uh, what has been mentioned by the previous speaker, uh, he uh, discussed in detail the trends of improvement of our legislation. Allow me uh, to formulate certain statements for future discussion. First, the problem of organizer adoption of the rules and agreement uh, on holding the international competitions in Russia. As uh, to 
uh, agreement on different international events that is determined by the Ministry of Sports, the Russian Sports Federation, and the head of the entity of the Russian Federation. Currently, not all the entities of the Russian Federation share the idea that it is necessary to hold international sports events. So the hockey, volleyball, and uh, football that are significant. These uh, competitions are held in the territory. Other types of the sport are not popularized. Uh, uh, and the next question for discussion uh, is the Legionnaires' limit and uh, procedure of attraction to participation in the national teams and in the International Sports Federation. Our president in April 2014 formulated the question on the necessity of developing such a procedure. Today, we have three concepts and three visions uh, concerning the use of labor of foreign citizens in the sphere of national teams. And this concept, uh, these concepts are different or even opposite. And if we want to find a common balance of interest of, uh, of the national uh, team of the country and increasing the prestige of our country, we need the balance of, of the quantity and quality of foreign citizens. Besides, this question has to be taken into account from the viewpoint of current labor law that provides uh, for the unity of legal regulation and legislation in the sphere of uh, uh, legal status of foreign citizens. That question also has to be solved now. And thirdly, concerning implementation of the guarantees and international rules into national legislation, there are different approaches of different countries on this matter. Particularly, Russia has selected a compromise position. Uh, we have both federal laws uh, which and the uh, governmental decrees, and it is permitted to have uh, regulation, unlike Belarus, where all the types of the sports uh, um, are registered at the Ministry of Justice. Therefore, common international and global order on that matter uh, should be formulated. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you, dear colleagues. All the panelists have made their presentations. Uh, do you have any questions to the panelists or any remarks? You're welcome. Anyone? Please. Thank you very much. I have the question to all the panelists. Uh, that is a question concerning the limit. As far as I understand, we have we shouldn't have one system in football. We have the championship of Russia that is organized by the league. Uh, as to the hockey league, we have Continental Hockey League, which is an international body, international federation, uh, and it has the rights to organize the championship of Russia. And it is a global unit in basketball. We have a common league and uh, the what is uh, different ideas are considered, but from the viewpoint of methodology, are we going to find common grounds for all sports types, or how will it be regulated? For instance, a special chapter was introduced to the Labor Code, particularly uh, concerning the specific features of coaches and sportsmen. Uh, similarly, from the viewpoint of harmonization of legislation on attraction of the foreign citizens. For instance, football, we are attracting a foreign coach, have to pay five million. For instance, Paletti in Zenit, uh, they paid five million, and, uh, and afterwards they also paid five million. How does it comply with general requ uh, requirements on attracting uh, foreign workers, skilled workers, please. What are your ideas from the viewpoint of solving these problems? Let me try uh, to answer this question because I'm one of the heads of the Russian Football Union. So probably that is a question to me. I will start from the end. Probably you live in St. Petersburg. Spalletti was relieved of uh, payment of these tax uh, for foreign coaches because when this norm was introduced, he was already the chief coach. Uh, and the idea 
of the limit per se is to protect I'm not speaking about uh, their coaches tax but on the limit on sportsmen that is an idea to artificially create better conditions for selecting the candidates to the national team because of the limiting on the persons which are in the field, for instance, in football, uh, seven at present, previously it was six, in hockey that is three persons. It makes it possible to guarantee the game practice uh, to the uh, persons who might be summoned to the national teams of the country. Different methodologies of limiting are discussed, passing from methodologies from the field model to the model on application. A certain number of persons that are included into the bid, I mean foreigners per season. Uh, uh, Ministry of Sport uh, uh, has started this work. But uh, it, has, uh, it is at the incipient stage, and in the consultations with all federations and organizers of uh, the um, competition working in Russia, because that is an order related to the team sport, that model will be developed. So I cannot give any definite answer now. The model is just at the stage of initial discussion. The existing model, according to the law on the legal status of the foreign citizen, when the uh, state uh, gives uh, issues a permit for work, proved to be inefficient for the sports. When the federation determines limit on the basis of Article 16 of the law of sport, that procedure appeared to be vulnerable because in the federation management club representatives might dominate or with hockey league there is a uh, possibility for using your imagination. So the state stated that it is necessary to enhance the state control in that sphere as to what means will be applied. It is difficult to say. So dear colleagues, let us uh, complete our work. Thank you very much. I would like to thank our guests <laughs> who have come from other countries who have come to attend this round table session. I think that the lack of large audience doesn't mean that there is no interest to the sports law. I think probably the organizers have taken into account that for the first time we're having this round table discussion. Thank you very much. I think that the themes that were discussed today will be carried on at the next event and the International Forum Russia Sports uh, country uh, in Chebaksari from the 6th to 11th uh, October, and invite all of you to continue this discussion at the next venue. Thank you very much. I'll see you. Thank you.